So today's speaker inspires a lot of emotion and people are incredibly excited and I am especially excited and honored that she's here with us today. Um, Jessica came to UC Berkeley in, from the East Coast in 2008 and graduated in 2010. During her time at Berkeley, she made a lot of critical connections. One you'll hear from in just a few minutes, Iklak Sidhu. And Jessica was one of the first people, um, one of the first group of uh, graduates from the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. And I think it's the first time we've had uh, someone speak here from uh, somebody who was at the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. She also was head of the Computer Science Association Undergraduate Association, where she made a lot more connections, uh, namely with Y Combinator. And then with an extensive pool of friends upon graduation, she began her journey with her current company, a Y Combinator alumni venture in De Niro. In De Niro was initially billed as the mint for business, then successfully pivoted, pivoted excuse me, to be the Uber for accountants. And I would like to say that I'm clever in thinking of those words myself, but Jessica is an incredibly uh, a clever way with words, so I think that came from her. Uh, it's now one of the fastest growing companies in the US, the fastest growing privately held company, with three billion in revenues and over 100 employees. Jessica has been recognized as one of the top 30 entrepreneurs under 30. She was recently on the cover of Inc. Magazine, and I'm not sure whether it's a blessing or a burden. She's been referred to as the female Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> um, frankly, I can't wait for the day when there is a man who is equally successful and he's referred to as the Jessica Ma of the world. So with that, Jessica, thank you for being here. And, and, so, Hold on, I, I just have to insert myself into the um, introduction process here. Um, and in part, it's because um, I, I, I just got a couple things that I have to communicate for or about Jessica here. So um, one, I wanna make it clear that she was literally sitting where you're sitting now, not that many years ago. Uh, I mean, she was in our classes, she was in our venture lab. I mean, she was not just in our class, she was in my class. I mean, um, and um, while we may disagree on how attentive <laughs> she was in my class, she was definitely in my class. But I will say, <laughs> I will say that I knew that she would be a successful entrepreneur right from that time when, when she was in the class. And I'll tell you this like really quick, story um, that uh, one day I, wa I was on the plot, it was just like right outside here, you know, in front of Citrix, uh, Citrus over here, and um, uh, somehow Jessica was nearby and Charlie Giancarlo, who's on our board of advisors, was nearby. I think I was close to or chatting with Charlie Giancarlo, and Charlie, um, you know, was basically the number two person at Cisco. Very powerful, very well connected, um, you know, and, and he's been on this stage actually, and, um, uh, you know, and, and a, like a very insightful person, uh, you know, and, and a solid executive. I mean, just overall, you know, there's so many people that would like to chat with Charlie about any number of entrepreneurial things and so forth. And so Jessica's nearby and I said, oh, Charlie, you know, you should, you should uh, meet Jessica. I just kind of, you know, a polite introduction, if you will. And within about 30 seconds, Jessica, maybe is a minute or something like that, Charlie, we should have lunch. And, and it was, I was like, there was no worry, no fear, not, like not any thought of like, that, you know, like, um, you know, how much background he has and how much necessary power or whatever. It was just basically like, yeah, you know, it's like we're, we're peers. And, um, and, and this is like your junior year or something like that in, in undergrad. And I, at that point, I knew I'm like, she's gonna be a successful entrepreneur. There's, there's just no fear and she's just ready to do it. And, and plus all of the other dynamics that, that we saw during that time. So after all of this, I'm, I'm really personally excited to welcome you back to this stage and back to this room, and this time as our speaker. Okay. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about your path, 
too, and at Berkeley, a little bit of the early years of the startup, which actually it hasn't been that much time, and then things that are happening now. And so uh, you've actually had a bit of a different, I'd say, path to come uh, to Berkeley and um, a little different path in high school. And I was just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about, about that. Yeah, sure. So I actually transferred into Cal as a junior. And I really wanted to come to Cal. I went here for summer school. And, I'm, and I thought, this place is really cool. I really want to stay here if I can. And that's when I applied to be a transfer student. And I came from an early college program on the East Coast. And I left high school when I was 15. So I, I never really finished high school. I never went to prom, did all that stuff. And it took me a while to figure out that I wanted to study computer science. I actually really wanted to do Haas at the time, but like my grades weren't good enough. So there's no way I would do that. And, um, and yeah, like, like I actually sat here when I was coming to lectures. Um, my favorite seats were right where you are and right where you are. And I would have my laptop out. I would be paying attention maybe half the time, like some of you are right now. And, uh, and then the other half of the time, I was like working on applications to like get money for my business. So I was applying to the business plan competitions. I applied, put in my CET application. And I remember wrapping both of those up right here in this front row. And then I worked on my Y Combinator application um, somewhere in this room as well. So all of that, this is a very productive room for me. <laughs> I could smell the money being made right now. Actually, with all that, you actually before were talking about all these incredibly technical classes that you took. What, like, how did you pick your classes, and, and how did that go? Yeah, well, I was in a really, like, like all the classes I took were technical because I had to. Uh, like, my first two years, I studied like a lot of random stuff, um, like really fun classes like Anthro, 2AC. I don't know if any of you took that. It's like really fun random classes, but then like I didn't figure out I wanted to do CS till the end of my sophomore year, so I had to get caught up in the, on the entire CS curriculum from start to finish, um, right when I started here. So, so it's basically chosen for me. So you had done stuff with computers, and my understanding is that as a 12-year-old, uh, you were already doing websites. I can hardly get my 12-year-old to empty the dishwasher, so it's very <laughs> impressive. Um, but how? What made you then decide? Hey, I think I do want to do CS. Um, I just really loved programming. Like, that was just really fun for me. And also, like, I was looking at all the majors where I could be the most, like, most successful in my career. And I just noticed that people who had some sort of engineering or technical background w had a lot of optionality. Um, and, and so that's kind of like how I ended up there. Like, it was the logical choice. I decided that based on a uh, process of elimination. And I'm really happy that I did that. Like, the CS program here is like really, really awesome, I think. And, and I was really happy with that. And so um, just curious, was it just fortuitous that you came into CET, or did you know what they were doing? Because it like, I think you'd only been here for a year. Uh, what year is this? 2008? Uh, 2008 or 2009. Right. Right. So no, actually four years. Oh, four years, OK. Four years, yeah. 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 Yeah, I heard about it. Um, how did I hear about it? Maybe I saw like a, a, a flyer on the wall or something. And it's like free money and office space. I'm like, how can I turn that down? <laughs> so that's how I, I applied. And, and it ended up being really cool because like the money, sure, it's good. But like the office space, the connections, and then um, being able to meet the other students doing their own business, I thought that was supremely more useful and helpful. And I kept in touch with like some of them um, you know, even today. And so. so you even headed up were president of the CS Undergrad Association. Yeah, um, I was voluntold to be the president because no one else wanted to be it. So they're like, hey, you need a president, you should run. But I didn't know that they were suckering me in for it. Um, so I did that. And, um, and yeah, like it was, really, it was really a great learning experience for me because I had to come into an existing organization and like change things. Whereas like now in my business, I got to start everything from scratch, from nothing, and that's way easier. So in a way, like my current business, getting that off the ground, I think of that as being way easier than the work I had to do as a CS student here at Cal. And, um, and that's actually really interesting for me to reflect on. Huh. And when you're doing the CS association work, you made some interesting connections there. Obviously, as we've heard, you're a good, you're a connector. Um, can you talk about some of the connections that you made there? I think that you had speakers come. Yeah. So my plan, my master plan was, as the president of the Computer Science Undergrad Association, was to bring in CEOs of great companies. So I brought in now the president of Y Combinator, Sam Altman, to come speak. 
And then I would take him to dinner afterwards, my treat, so I could network with him. And then I brought in the CEO of Dropbox, who's still a friend of mine. Um, I, he wasn't my friend until I invited him to speak here, and then I generously took him out to dinner afterwards to network. Um, so this was part of my plan, and it was really effective. And so, do you, so <laughs> when you were doing those applications, um, wherever it was, for Y Combinator, was it after or before you'd heard Altman, and was it all kind of connected? I heard about it um, af uh, like while I brought in those speakers. That's when I thought, hey, maybe I should really do this. And at that point, I already got uh, the CET thing. I already like got rejected in the business plan competition, so I didn't even make it past round one. Um, but you know, I thought, let's just try. Worst case, I get rejected. Not a big deal. And this was all with the, the idea of Indonero. Uh, yeah, this was with Indonero, but it was an earlier rendition of Indonero. So I didn't start. So today, Indonero does all the accounting and taxes for a small business. So we give the software and we give the service. And the difference is when we first started, we thought, let's just build a little software tool that helps businesses visualize their money easier online. So it was, li it was slightly different back then, and but it was fundamentally like in this accounting space. So we had a speaker professor, um, Ian Stoika, talk yes, uh, last week, and he was telling us about the importance of starting a business with friends. Mm. And I'll come back to that a a later again. But I who did you start it with? Yeah, I met this guy in, uh, uh, here at Cal, who, and who's still like my really close friend. He's actually my best friend. And we studied in discrete mathematics together. Um, and I remember not being very good at the class. So my goal was, who's the smartest kid in the classroom who I could befriend? And we could do homework together. <laughs> so that's how I met him. <laughs> and so, and and I thought that there were also other people. There were like six or five other people that were in the company when you started. It, was it all people from Cal? Yeah, they're all Cal people, and I met some of them um, through other means. Um, some of them through class, some of them in the CSUA. Um, but yeah, like my co-founder Andy, I met him because I remember like everyone thought this guy is a big shot. He's the one who did the homework first, and then everyone else would struggle. So he'd throw the homework in the middle of the table, and it'd be like a mad fest. Everyone would jump in trying to get his homework to copy off of it. Oh, that's fantastic. So, I'm so like, this guy's my new best friend. <laughs> what, what was it about the Indonero idea? I mean, you didn't end up being pre Haas or going to Haas. No. You, know, you didn't do accounting. What was it? Why did you think you could do this? I thought I could do it because it was like I had experienced the problem firsthand running like small businesses before. Like, accounting and tax was such, such a nightmare. And um, I knew it'd be really hard to do, which was cool because then other people wouldn't work on that problem as well. Like it'd be a really, uh, it'd be really hard for someone else to compete, and it wasn't very capital intensive. Like I could build the solution myself because I knew how to program. So that's really why I decided to pick this business over other ideas. How did you look? I mean, at, at that point, there was Quicken, I think, or, or QuickBooks, uh, I think at least there yeah, was. QuickBooks. How did you decide that you could do, like, how did you look at the competition and decide what you could do differently? Yeah, well, Andy and I basically charted out like a bunch of industries on our whiteboard. We were in uh, Clark Kerr at the time, and we we're like, okay, what's a business idea that can make a lot of money, that's a big problem, that doesn't have much innovation, and isn't capital intensive? So those were our criteria for a good business. And this seemed to fit all three of those criteria. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so we were like pretty like logical about it. It didn't just hit us one day, hey, like let's do an accounting startup. Like, no, we like mapped it out on a whiteboard and really thought it through. So uh, one of the students had had a, a question, and that was, I mean, you did a lot of different stuff, and the question, the student's question was about balance. Uh -huh. Do you have any thoughts for students now? I mean. You, I, I assume that you might have slept, but it doesn't sound like you did. Uh, any thoughts on what you kind of wished you'd balanced differently when you look back on your experience? Yeah, it was really, really tough. Um, like, I've reflected on that. Like, I wasn't the greatest student here. Um, like, for a while, I was thinking, OK, after school, I should brag about, like, how I was really smart, blah, 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 blah. That's totally not true. Like, I was not the greatest student. That's something I really regret a little bit. Like, I wish I focused more in class. Um, and I know Iklak is like Jessica, probably the worst student here. Uh, <laughs> I was like not very attentive at all. I was too busy trying to you know apply to get some free money. Um, so that was that's what I was doing. And um, so I, I think that's something I would have done a little differently. It's hard to balance schoolwork and also building a business at the same time. You do have to commit and pick one or the other. 
or else both will not be very good. And I just picked the business route. That was best for me, personally, I thought. Um, I think it's interesting. I, I, I'm not, I don't know this for sure, but you seem to have incredibly supportive parents um, who weren't necessarily focused on what your grades were or weren't. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, they were always concerned with me like growing up because I would um, oscillate bet between like doing really well in school, like getting all straight A's versus not getting straight A's and doing some sort of side business. So they were always really worried about that. And at the end, I think they just wanted me to like, you know, pass my classes and be okay in life. And, and so they were, they were supportive in the end. Yeah. But yeah, that was, really, that was really tough on them. They weren't happy about that. Um, so oh. I was going to actually refer to, to Icock's story because as he's now told all of you all, I've heard the story a couple of times also with Charlie Giancarlo. Um, what is it? So we have a lot of interesting speakers who are coming through not just this course, but a lot of the courses at Cal. Yeah. What would you recommend to, to people if they are interested in making a connection? How would you go about it um, if it's not necessarily as innate as it seems to be with you? Yeah, well, for me, it was pretty innate. Like, I love talking to the speakers afterwards. And then I had my own speaker program, so I could invite them to my speak speaking engagements. And then I would get it taken out to my complimentary dinner afterwards. So I had that built in. And so I was just really creative about coming up with, with those ideas for how to meet people. And Did you have a conversation with Charlie Giancarlo? Did you all go out to dinner? I don't think he ended up making time for me, but <laughs> hey, it's worth, it was worth a try. And like, I did that with so many people, and even if only 50% of them hit, like, that's still great. So you immediately, upon graduation, went, it almost went into Y Combinator. Uh, no, I directly went to Y Combinator, and I don't think I would have done that if I didn't meet these like, great CEOs who I brought into to give talks for the CSUA. Did you consider going into regular corporate, uh, being a coder at a larger company? I didn't really consider the traditional path because um, it just didn't really seem right for me. Like I didn't think I'd be able to keep a job very long. Like I'd probably just get fired for for being like a bad employee or not following directions or something. Um, so that wasn't really in the cards for me. And so when you were, how long were you at Y Combinator? How long was the program and then? It was like a three month program. And what did that do for you all? Well, so Y Combinator was really cool because you're full time working on your business and you get to meet all these other like really hardworking entrepreneurs and you get to connect with each other, you get to inspire each other, help each other with contacts. And then they give you connections to the media, to investors. So that's how I got access to capital. And like as a 20 year old without any work experience, like how else are you gonna find a million dollars? Like it, you gotta do something like that to get access to that type of money. So I think when you got that, there were these stories of this kind of a wonderkind, sorry, you know, to use my German there, yeah. uh, who'd all of a sudden gotten this money. How, how, how did you react to that? Um, at, so yeah, that's when the, the Mark Zuckerberg story came out. And it was hilarious because my friends mentioned that and like, my, my habit is I don't read my own press. Like, I don't read the articles. Do you mind uh, talking a little bit of the back, background? I mean, you all got, how much did you get? And yeah, why was it such like a big deal? Yeah, we got like a million dollars from a lot of investors. And it happened like really fast. It was just like really easy for us at the time because we were really good at getting press. Like, we were in the New York Times, CNN, like, like all over the place. And we were really good at press. And I had a great press person who I met because of my Berkeley contacts, actually, who helped me line up all this media. And that helped me get the million dollars. And that helped me get even more press. So it's kind of like this self-perpetuating cycle. And a lot of these people um, spoke really like highly of me because I think they really wanted someone to build up. But like my business really didn't justify it. And frankly, even the press we get today, I think is a little bit unjustified. I mean, like, yeah, I've done some cool stuff, but not that cool yet. So, so I don't know. I don't really let it get to my head. So my, my philosophy is, okay, if I read an article about myself that talks negatively about me, then I'm going to feel bad. But if it talks too like, highly about me, then it might get to my head. So I just rather not read it at all. Um, speaking of getting a million dollars and maybe letting something go to the, 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 the group head, I'm, I'm thinking of um, a hot tub on the roof of uh, San Francisco. Can you talk about those heady early days? 
Yeah, we did get like really ahead of ourselves. Like when we first got the money, we were like not really like good at spending it properly. Like we weren't very frugal. Like we got a hot tub in our office, which I thought was awesome at the time. You threw great parties there, by the way. Um, I would invited all of you. But um, but yeah, like investors weren't like that impressed by our progress. Um, and yeah, like we were we weren't like focused on the numbers, but we had a great lifestyle. So I was, I was looking at something where you talked about some of the numbers were really good. There were certain numbers that were good, and then somebody asked you about some of the other numbers. Yeah. Um, what were the numbers that you thought initially sounded good? Um, we were really good at getting like users. Like our user graph looked like a hockey stick chart, um, and that came because of all of the PR we had done. The problem is that we weren't monetizing them. They weren't paying us money, so we couldn't really build a good business around that. And so we were burning through this money really quickly. We weren't going to be able to raise more money. And so the dream was going to come to an end unless we figured something out at that point. So I, I remember reading somewhere that somebody asked you how much you were making, and you said, oh, $80,000. And they were like, a day, a month? And you're like, uh, a, a year. <laughs> yeah. So that That's wasn't a lot of money if you're burning, you know, a million dollars a year. So, I mean, basically, you started Y Combinator in 2010, in Y Combinator in 2010, mm -hmm. and then I think it was already the summer of 2011, um, which you kind of had a, a, a kind of a come to Jesus. And can oh. you talk a little bit about that summer? Yeah, sure. Maybe it was like the fall of 2011, and uh, we were like running out of money. We couldn't get more money. Um, and one of our investors came by, and he he said, "Oh, it's so like." Like, how are things going, Jessica? And I'm like, things are going great. And he's like, come on, like, really, how are things actually going? And, and so I had confessed that things weren't as great as they may have seen. And he's like, yeah, seriously, the hot tub, Jess? So um, he kind of saw through that. And, and he's like, well, look, it's not too late to change. Um, you could like alter your course and get on the right track and figure something out. And um, that person, Steve Blank, I know he teaches here. You should really attend his classes um, if you can. Um, and he's written like some great books. And um, so I wanted to go back to basics, follow his advice. And his advice was, well, go back to your customer and see like what would they pay money for and what are the real problems that you're solving for them. And I had kind of got, got distracted. I wasn't doing enough of that. And so I went back and uh, spent more time actually visiting my customers. In the meanwhile, we were running out of money, so I called up all my Berkeley friends at the time, who were all really good friends, we're like family at this point, and I said, guys, like, we're running out of capital, uh, you have to go and find a new job because we're not gonna be able to make payroll in two months from now unless you get a new job. Um, and so all of them left and thankfully got new jobs really quickly, so we didn't have to lay anyone off, but they were still really uh, difficult conversations, and it was also a really big like ego hit for me because I had built myself up a little bit, um, and yeah, that was that was really that was a really tough time for me, um, and also a lot of my friends that I was like really successful, and I wasn't, and and so now I'm like okay, I'm just not gonna let myself feel too good. Well, it, it's interesting that you say that because a lot of people talk about um, the importance of failure, but I've never encountered anybody who's talked about it as authentically and delved into it so much um, that you do. And, and you talk about it a lot, and you talk about it very openly, and uh, it's, it appears that you want others to learn from it. Um, For sure. Why, why do you think you're that, like, what has come from that, from uh, being so openly so open about it and how you feel about it. Yeah, well, it was actually accidental. Like, I didn't want to talk about this. It's kind of shitty to talk about failure, actually. Um, it's, like, not very fun. But my mentor, Steve Blank, who I mentioned teaches here, um, unfortunately also teaches at Stanford. So he gave me a call and said, hey, give a talk at Stanford. And I'm like, all right, fine. So I go down to Stanford. I'm in the midst of, you know, this, I'm literally in the pit of despair. And the talk is online, you could watch it. I have no employees left. And then there, I was really not doing that great. And I was in a really bad mood that day. Like I was really like not happy. And so we talked and I just like laid it all out. And the common sentiment is, all right, well, hope you get through this. And, um, and 
I remember thinking, wow, like if I like pull myself out, at least I could reflect and watch this talk and see what I was thinking and how I reacted when things were really bad, um, if I ever get out, that is. Um, so that was like really interesting. And after that, I got so many emails from people all around the world. Like that talk like got more views than you know some of the top CEOs who gave talks um, for Stanford ETL. And and people are emailing saying, hey, like I really love you sharing your story. I really hope I'm really rooting for you. I hope you get through this. And so after that, I started sharing it more openly because I realized that people had a lot to learn from it and that so many others went through something so similar. So can you, as you were trying, as you had no employees, almost, you know, no one left and it was, I guess it was you and Andy? Yeah, it was just pretty much me and my co-founder, um, my classmate friend from Berkeley. And so what did you, you started looking at the customer and how did you think to pivot, how what happened there? So you had basically started out being the um, like a, a tool for everybody for business um, to track everything for business, not necessarily for accountants. So how did that pivot come about? Well, the pivot came about because I would call the few customers and I said, "Let me come to your office and I want to watch you do your work." And there was this one customer who I was sitting behind and I was just watching him use into narrow, and it was just really kind of uh, like my blood was boiling because it was just really annoying to see all the bugs in my software and like just all these other horrible things. And he was spending his time on like features that were just not really working too great. And he said, look, I would pay you, right now I pay you 20 bucks a month. I'd pay you thousands of dollars if you could do my accounting and my taxes for me, just like take care of it. And that was our selling point. We were trying to do that automatically. We weren't doing a very good job. And here he was offering to pay us thousands of dollars more. Um, so I said, yes, we should do that. We should just charge thousands of dollars more and actually do the work for him. And so that's when we shifted course. Um, and, and I called up all my friends. Like I went through my Facebook, my LinkedIn, my phone book, and I called everyone. I'm like, look, like I've got this accounting solution. Like I should just take care of it for you and I'll save you money against hiring an accountant. And that was the, that was the selling point back then. So there's a kind of an interesting story where you talked to one of your friends and they gave you, a, I think they gave you a check. Yeah, I called up one friend um, whose business is now defunct, but I called her at the time and, and I went through my presentation. So I put together a PowerPoint presentation. I followed the Steve Blank um, like process, literally word by word, if you read his book. Um, and he says, like basically put together your selling point, your selling presentation and go out and try to make some money even before you fully built out your solution. So that's what I did. I put together a PowerPoint solution. I sold it. She was like, yes, I want to sign up. And in anticipation of that, I had already printed out a contract for her to sign and a credit card authorization form. So, so as I was paying for our lunch, she gave me her credit card to write down her info. Um, but, but it was a pizza lunch, right? Yes, yeah, a pizza yeah. lunch. <laughs> um, it was high end pizza. but. We uh, didn't have a way to process her credit card for another three months. So. so as you all started to do this pivot, one of the things that you said had happened when you first came out, you had all these customers, um, and a lot of it was from media. So this kind of, after the pivot, how did you start? Was it the same way of getting customers, or how did you all go about building up the customer base again? We were really quiet about it. Like I tried to keep it really low key. I didn't want to call the media at all. I wanted to just stay under the radar for as long as possible. And so now it's been a little over three years and then we just started going after press recently. But my mentor Steve always told me, hey, like make sure that you only get press when you're ready for the press, when you could take on the extra customers. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, just be careful because if you're overexposed then if you like screw up your business, then people are going to mock you in the media for a very long time. So I really thought a lot about that, and I tried to not go out until, I mean, earlier this year was our first uh, re-entry back into the media. Did you all do an announcement, or, or how did that work? Um, the New York Times called me, actually. Um, so it had been almost five years since I was written up in the New York Times when you know they wanted to build me up. And she's like, so what happened to your business? And I told her the whole story. She's like, holy crap, like my editor's gonna love this. So, so it's front page of the Business Times. Um, and that was, that was how we got back into it. Um, and then slowly like other media outlets started to pick it up and then eventually Inc. got their story. So you did a lot on the product side, obviously, but 
as all that's happening on the product side, there's a lot going on internally also in the company. And I think, uh, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but someone had asked you if you'd ever fired anybody. Uh -huh. Can you, do you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, so like when I was early on in my business, um, I had another investor, um, and I really love this guy. He, I consider him a mentor too. His name's Anton, and he was one of the first guys at Mint. And um, you know, if you're calling your business a mint.com for business, it'd be nice to have someone at Mint, you know, actually as an investor. And he said, hey, Jessica, like, have you had to fire anyone yet? And I'm like, no, of course not. Like, I'm really good at hiring. He's like, nah, you're lying, or you're just really, uh, you have some bad people in your company probably. You should really go through and make sure that everyone is like A plus caliber. Like, would you, and then the question now is, would you enthusiastically rehire everyone in your business knowing what you know today? If you think about it, the answer is very rarely, yeah, I would enthusiastically rehire every single person. So that made me think about that a lot more. And, um, and so with all these mentors that I've had, like they ask some really powerful questions that really make me rethink everything. I think that's, is that's really great. Is there something that you do to nurture mentors? I think people think of it the other way around, what mentors are supposed to do for you, but I'm wondering what you do for them to, to enable them giving this advice. I mean, there's so much we can do for mentors, but the most important thing at the end of the day is to actually like take their feedback really seriously and change the business based on it. Like, yeah, you could send them Christmas cards and take them out to nice dinners and, and give them equity in your company, but they're not motivated by that. They want to see you like listen to their advice and actually act on it. And with Steve and with Anton and with many other mentors that I've had, you know, I really take their advice seriously and, and they don't tell me, hey, you should do this or hey, you should do that. They ask a very thought-provoking question and it really makes me think about things on a deeper level. So um, this past summer, it seems like you um, went from uh, met talking with mentors to you all talking to a counselor. And, and that was certainly in the press about marriage counseling. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, well, well as you all know, like my co-founder uh, was one of my best friends from college, and he's still a really close friend of mine. And um, we like, had a lot of fights. And maybe like a year and a half to our pivot, um, I was, we were yelling about something. Like, I think I called him a really horrible engineer, which is false, he's a great engineer. And he's like, well, you're a horrible manager. And I'm like, what? Like, that's, you that's. You were really getting to blows there. Yeah, we were really <laughs> just going at each other. And, and, and we were just yelling at each other. He's like, you know, like, I could just leave the company. Like, like, I don't need you to do this. I could just quit. And I'm like, no, you can't quit if I fire you. And it was just like really bad. Uh, <laughs> He's like, fine, I'm gonna call my parents and move back in with them. I'm like, fine, you really wanna do that? <laughs> um, so anyway, we stopped talking to each other for like three or four days. And, um, and then his idea was, let's like call a marriage counselor. I'm like, what, we're not married and we're not romantic and like none of that, we're just like friends here. He's like, no, like we could get our relationship back on track. I mean, come on, like we used to be best friends. I'm like, we're not anymore. And, uh, and so we went to Yelp and we searched marriage counselor on Yelp, and Yelp actually has some great marriage counselors there, you should all give it a try. <laughs> and so we went down the list and started calling people, and people are like, what, like, you want marriage counseling? It's kind of weird, but one guy said, yeah, this is great, you guys should totally come in, and it's basically the same thing. Um, I mean, you're not married, you know, there's no sex involved, but like, otherwise it's the same thing. And, and so we went, and we got a lot out of it, and we, and we really like got through a lot of our communication difficulties because we didn't know how to give each other proper feedback. Like I couldn't criticize him uh, in a productive, constructive way and vice versa. So we got through that through counseling and we still go every few months now. So um, even though things are good, you wanna still keep that going when things are good. So you all could have had that be private. How did that get to be so public? Um, I mean, I'm like a pretty open book. Like, I, I don't like to, like when I was like in school and trying to listen to CEOs, I always thought, wow, there's like more to the story than meets the eye. And I felt that like when I sat up here, everyone who I would watch, like they wanted to make things seem, they made business seem way too easy and straightforward. And that really rubbed me the wrong way. So I thought, you know, like better to just be open. Um. Speaking of being open, you're a fairly early blogger, uh, Girl Meets World. Can you talk a little bit about what 
that blog is and, and why you have that and, and what it does for you? I had a blog starting from when I was 16. I called it Just Come Mom Meets World. <laughs> and it was, it was actually a really great blog. Like I was getting 80,000 uniques uh, a month for a while. And I talked about my thoughts on business, which I was very unqualified to write about. But people loved the blog, and I made some great friends and connections from it. And um, in fact, like I got one deal I just closed last month. Like It's already a six-figure deal. I think it'll make us you know, in the millions. And that came from um, this guy who just cold emailed me when I was 17. And it's like, hey, I love your blog. I think it's awesome. We should meet for dinner. I'm like, creepy guy on the internet cold emailing me? Yeah, why not? So did he take you out for pizza? Uh, we went out to dinner. We hung out. And we're still friends. And, and it led to a lot of business for us. So we're, like, you do get a lot of press. Uh, where do you go? When do you find time to run your company? How do you manage that all now? What, how are you planning to move forward? Yeah, I always wondered about the best way to do it. Honestly, I don't think I'm doing a very good job at that right now. Like October was my like month to be a more public CEO, like make connections, do networking, give talks, and um, and and do like some more media. But like I should really focus more on the business. So like November and December. And January, I've like really blocked off most of it just to focus on my work. And so it kind of goes in waves. Like one month, I'll be like more visible. And then one month, I'm going to go back and focus on my work. So, so I'm trying to work that out. But there's like no great solution there. So I, I thought I talked to you about this earlier. I thought it was interesting in your you know, month of traveling in October. You also were in Austin at the Conscious Capitalism Summit. Oh, yeah, that's a great I'm conference. just curious what that was and what people do there. And it's such an oxymoron, right? Yeah. Conscientious, no, conscious, conscious, is it? Conscious Capitalism yeah. Summit, yeah. No, oh. I really like that event. Um, like, maybe about a year ago, like, we were doing OK in business, but I was really kind of starting to think, wow, like, what is this all for? Like, sure, what if you make a lot of money? Um, then what? Like, what does this all lead to? And, you know, at Berkeley, we think a lot about that. We want to make a difference. We want to make an impact. We're not just doing things for the money. And I was really struggling with that. I'm like, all right, what's my calling? How could I make a bigger difference? How could Indian Air be a vehicle for change? And, and so that's kind of what led me to thinking about that. And now I talked to a lot of CEOs. I'm like, all right, what's your goal with this? How are you going to make a difference in the world through your business? And, and there are a lot of ways. And there are a lot of books out there. So that's just something I'm trying to work more into my life. Like, how can we do more for our team members who work at Indian Air? How can we do more for our customers to help them? do better in their business? How can we help nonprofits with their accounting? I mean, they're horrible at accounting. Or like, I try to give talks to a lot of like, uh, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs, and I really enjoy that because I get like so many great letters from people saying, hey, like, like I'm really trying to get my business off the ground, and I could use your help. So I'm trying to incorporate that more into my work. So you, you may not consciously do that. This, but you are an incredible symbol for for women, and and you know you're on the cover of Inc, and that's fantastic to see you. And recently, you were quoted, um, I think I, I wrote delightfully unapologetic. Um, can you talk about your experience as a female entrepreneur and how that's if that has been changing and how that's been changing? Um, I like to talk to a lot of like women in business in particular because I do think that they approach business in a different way. It's so, like I try to host like women CEO dinners at my house. I'm doing one tomorrow, actually, in case anyone here wants to come. Um, so I do, I do those. How big's your house? Uh, not very big. Um, but I do that every month now, and that's been really powerful. And, um, and so yeah, I mean, I'm thinking a lot about that. And at first, I didn't really care about it. I'm like, whatever. I'm just going to focus on my business. And this person named Patty Sellers, she's the editor-in-chief at Fortune. I met with her early on. I was hoping that she'd write a story on me. She never did. But she said, Jessica, like, you've got to care about this stuff, because whether or not you realize it, you're going to be a role model. And you could be a good role model, or you could be a horrible role model. It's your pick. But no matter what, you're a role model. So I thought about that, and I really, I really took that in. And over the years, I've tried to incorporate that philosophy into my my media work. Uh, that's great. When uh, In reading the Inc. article, if you all have a chance to read it or anything about it, it's fantastic. It talks about the fastest growing companies in, in, in the US, the privately held companies. Um, I have a copy up here in case anyone wants to see it. Can later. I? Yeah, sure. I feel like I'm. 
don't forget to go out and get your copy of ink. Um, there she is. Uh, but one of the things that they start the, the uh, article, they talk about something that a lot of the entrepreneurs have in common, uh -huh. and it's being a student. And oh, really? Yeah. I haven't I mean, read it yet. Yeah. So. It does talk. I don't read about my press. At, at least when I was looking at it, it kind of weaves that in there. And, oh. and uh, I thought it was interesting. And I thought it was interesting because I feel like there's certain things that you do that you're still learning. And I'm wondering, I, I don't even, I'm thinking you're flying. And oh. I'm wondering if you could tell us why you even, I mean, you're so busy. But it seems like you're flying also. Yeah, well, I mean, the greater point is that like when business was not doing well, um, I really needed to find other ways to keep myself happy. And I thought, okay, well, I got my personal life, my family life, my hobbies, and my friendships. And those all really went down the drain when I was so focused on my business. Like, I didn't really visit my parents in New York very often. Now I visit them all the time. I try to go back like seven, eight, nine times a year. Um, and friends, like, I didn't really see my friends at all. Now I like really block off a lot of time on weekends to see them. And that fell by the wayside. And hobbies, I didn't really have any hobbies. And when my business like went into the ground three years ago, I had a lot of extra time. So I really got to think about, about like what I wanted to do. And I'm in a way thankful that I had that experience, that forced experience. Um, and so you got your pilot's license? I got my pilot's license. I love to fly. Um, yeah, that's really fun. We could talk about that later. <laughs> Um, so very expensive hobby, though. There, it just seems like, uh, speaking of you know Jessica Mommy's world, there, there's a lot going on in, in the world for you. What do you see? Uh, what are the things that you're looking forward to uh, tackling or looking at next? Um, I mean, there's a lot of things I'm looking forward to in my business. Like, I really want to grow a lot more. We have 150 employees, and I'd really like to know what it's like to have over a thousand employees um, at some point if the business could really justify it. And I think there's just so much impact we can make um, directly as a business to our customers, to like our team members. Like we've got a lot of young staff and a lot of, a lot of women coming to work with us. Like our new office, we got like, I mean, we're getting the 50-50 on the gender ratio, which is pretty incredible, I think. And I think we could really help these like women like build up into leadership positions. And that's really hard for a lot of them if they're working at other tech companies. So there's a lot of stuff I'm thinking about there. Um, I am still really worried about my business. I'm still really worried about my progression. And, um, and yeah, like I'll confess that I still really stress out about, about where I'm going. Like when I, like three years ago, I remember hanging out with my first new employee and I'm like, hey, like once we get this to a million a year in business, like let's just go hang out on the beach all day, do a little mini retirement. And like obviously that happened really quickly and we're not sitting on a beach. We're stressing out about how we could make this be a very valuable company. And I think that's something I didn't really realize when I was first a student and I really wish I did. Like I wish that I knew that there's no time that it gets really easy and that you're set. Like that's just completely false. Um, but I thought okay, you get to escape velocity and then everything's okay. Um, so that's something I've been working on. So I still see like an executive coach. I still have a therapist. I still like do all that stuff to work on my mental health. And that's something that I encourage like all my other CEO friends to do. And you'd be surprised to learn that the vast majority of extremely successful CEOs uh, do have a therapist. They probably won't admit it uh, the way I might, but, um, but I think it's like really important. You, on your LinkedIn profile, offer people the opportunity to get in touch with you really openly. Do people take advantage of that? Are you, do um, you some, it's a little some further do. down, but yeah. Yeah, um, I do get emails from people asking for like thoughts, and I will try to reply to them. Um, but yeah, like not, not as many people take me up on it as I would think. Interesting. Well, you, you've been so incredibly open with us and gone through uh, over so many different things that I'd really like to open it up for questions from you all now. And I would love to get a microphone on the question. So do we have one mic? We have, ah, perfect. Is, okay. So my name's Sam Adad. I'm a Berkeley student, junior, uh, doing computer science much like you. Uh, during the period between 
lay, or not laying off, but asking a lot of your friends to find other jobs. And now, what did you do? How did you run on such little money or how much money were you running on per year? And were you selling your product during this time or was it completely on product development during that time? Uh, that's a really good question. So after we asked everyone to find a new job, and it was just my co-founder and I, we decided to take a few months and just kind of relax for a bit. You could work yourself out of a problem, but I thought that we needed to take a step back and rejuvenate ourselves personally and also to get some more creative ideas for how we could get ourselves out of the ditch. So we didn't focus at all on sales and marketing. We didn't do any media. We worked on product development, but we were running around in circles. We needed some sort of big pivotal idea change. And, and we did a lot of fun trips. Like we like spent some time going to Disney World. We went up to Tahoe. Like we really had fun during that time. I think I was actually happier during that time period than I am now, ironically. Um, and yeah, um, we didn't have much money left. We had maybe 150 grand left in the bank account. Um, I had my parents sponsoring my rent. My co-founder Andy had his parents sponsoring his apartment rent. We That's also a new way of saying it, sponsoring your rent. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we ended up converting it into investment money, so they'll make a lot of money off of it, actually. But, um, but yeah, they were sponsoring it. They're very generous, and we were on a really tight budget. Like we were, I remember going to Costco. We like. We were on like a tight $10 per dinner budget, and Andy's like, oh, I want to get pickles for our sandwiches. I'm like, we can't afford the pickles. We're going to go over the $10 budget. Uh, so yeah, we were on pretty tight money back then. But um, yeah, weird times. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering. A, bit, a little about a little bit about uh, the sales side of your development in your company because I know you talked a lot about the business side. I mean, like the engineering side, and you're coming up with the idea. But how did you actually get the customer base of like consumers for your product? Yeah, well, at first it was self-service. We didn't have sales like in the old Indian era. That was all through media, and people would sign up themselves. In the new Indian era, since we charge thousands of dollars, if not tens of thousands of dollars. We actually have salespeople talking to Indonero potential customers and basically selling Indonero to them. I did maybe the first few hundred grand worth of sales myself, and that was just me calling up all my friends. And I literally went through my Facebook, my LinkedIn, my phone book, and I would text people. I'd say, hey, like, how's your business going? Let's grab lunch. And then I would you know, sell them on Indonero. And and I would actually do a lot of the delivery work and customer service myself as well. And I did that until I felt comfortable enough to have hire a salesperson to take my place. So, yeah, that's a good question. Down here, Eugene. Oh, thanks. Hi, uh, Orion Parrott. I actually graduated from the business school recently. Oh, Just trying congrats. to plug in over here more. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned waiting for press till the right time, oh, yeah. but you also had some early press, and was that something you sought out, or it just came to you and you worked with it? I sought out the early, early press, just for some context. Graduation day was May 19. I know because my birthday was May 18, so I could say I finished while I was still 19. <laughs> um, and then we launched on July 3rd of 2010. So if you think about it, that's about six weeks which, between me leaving Berkeley and me launching publicly my product. That's not a lot of time. And I called up my friends in the media. I had Y Combinator, our first investors, help us with the first contacts. And I had five media outlets talk about the company all on the same day. Um, so that was the approach. Um, in hindsight, we could have waited a little longer. Yeah. Hi. I'm a political economy major. Um, I wanted to ask, what do you think makes a good team? And how did you and your co-founder split up the work? We were really good at splitting up the work on day one. Like It was very clear that I was more businessy and not as good academically. And he was really good on the technical stuff. So like I could still program, and I taught him a lot of the like 
practical web programming that we do today, but it was clear that he'd be a lot better at that. So it's pretty obvious. Um, and then as far as what makes for a good team, like we really look for uh, strong work ethic, people who are in incredibly smart, and um, people who like had big ambition. Um, but yeah, we could talk about that more afterwards. That's like a really big topic in itself. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, my name is Ruta. I'm also studying computer science uh, at Berkeley. I'm a freshman. And I was wondering, where was that point when you were a student that you just decided that the idea was strong enough to just turn it into a business and you didn't have to worry so much about the schooling as much as the idea and getting the idea off the ground? Did you have a fully formulated like plan ahead of you for like the 10 year plan or like a five year plan for what was going to come next? Or like when did you decide, you know, whatever about education, I just really want to take this through? Yeah, we didn't really have a good long-term plan. That really bothered a lot of people, I think, because the traditional business school path is, all right, well, you have to really plan things out. And for me, I just didn't think it'd be possible to have a good plan. And my mentor, Steve, uh, you know, he's going to go against the grain at the business school. And he would tell his students at Haas that no business plan survives the first contact with customers. That's his quote. And I really believed that. And after seeing what I went through, um, any five-year plan would have been ridiculous. We just had a, but we were passionate enough about it to want to give it a try anyway. When did you decide? When did we decide to commit to it and really work on it? I think we knew we would work on a business idea and commit to it no matter what and make that the focus. And it was just a matter of what was the business idea going to be. So, um, so yeah, we weren't very, uh, confident that it would work, but wanted to do it anyway. Hi, my name is Dante, third year, business and CS. Um, cool. I wanted to kind of hear what, what, at the end of the day, what motivates you, what inspires you? Um, and also, like, what percentage of your time do you spend, uh, like, studying for school versus, like, doing your own business? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> I'm really motivated by like helping like everyone who works with me. I'm really motivated by my customers. I'm really motivated by like the emails I get from random people all across the world who like really love like reading my blog or reading about me in the media or whatever. So that's really inspiring for me and that keeps me motivated because there are a lot of days when I'm not motivated at all. Um, it's hard to admit that, but that's the truth. As far as like my focus between school and um, business. Like I remember back at Cal, the thought was on Friday night, I would order pizza um, or go to the Asian ghetto, bring food back to my dorm. And Andy and I would do our homework. We were in 61A, we were in discrete math and like a few other classes. I forget what they are at the moment, but we would do all of our homework on Friday night. And as soon as we finished, then we get to work on our business. So that was kind of our prioritization. And the sooner we finish the homework, the sooner we get to work on our business. Um, in practice, it ended up being like pretty well balanced, like the weekend could be majority business and like less than 25% uh, school, but that's only because we were like focused, we were motivated to get the school work out of the way. Um, most people would probably just drink and party. So speaking of drinking and partying, we have had different speakers who've talked a little bit about how they celebrate um, their successes or oh. how do you celebrate it in De Niro? I'd say we're not actually really good at celebrating. Like that's feedback that comes up in our feedback surveys. Um, and I think that just comes down to the fact that like for me, it's really hard to be appreciative and smell the roses. That's one thing I do know I need to get a lot better at. And um, so yeah, I don't really do enough of that. I, don't, I can't think of a milestone that I really celebrated ever. Um, but that's something I could really improve on. So thanks for asking. I, I, I think that this is pretty much of a milestone that you're back in this class on this side now. And it and doesn't look like anybody's asleep. So thank you very, very much. Uh, I know that Jessica will be here if you have questions afterwards, but I can't thank you enough. Thanks.